My name is Michael St. Clair. I am the Director of Platform Engineering at uh, PDQ. And at PDQ, we have a product called Connect that enables cloud-based device management. Um, recently, one of the projects I've been working on is load testing this uh, product, specifically with the WebSocket connections we utilize to connect to an Elixir backend. Um, I do not have my notes on this, dang it. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, with our product, our customers are sysadmins, and when they want to manage a device, uh, they, when they're managing a device, they want to be able to get instant feedback on what is happening with that device. When we initially launched our product, it used to use polling and would make a request about every minute to go and check with the back end on any pending tasks that it needed to run. However, this ended up adding a significant load to our database, and as we started scaling devices, uh, it was uh, a little too much. So what we tried is moving to WebSockets. And the WebSockets were able to gain us of being able to store state on that process. And that way, we did not have to continually go back to the database to get the same information over and over again. It also provided the benefit of when an admin would schedule a task, we could instantly tell the device about it as the device was already connected, and it didn't have to wait for the device to check in. Now, before we talk a little bit about the load testing efforts, I want to provide some context on how our product architecturally works, um, just so things make a little bit more sense. So we have an agent that gets installed on an endpoint, for example, an employee laptop. That agent will then initiate a WebSocket connection all the way through our infrastructure to an Elixir backend. When the WebSocket is connected, the Elixir backend will then figure out any tasks that have been queued since the device went offline and send them to the device and also schedule scans. The device will then receive those messages, process and perform any tasks it was supposed to, and then send the results back over the WebSocket. Um. Okay. So, Often, that uh, diagram I just showed was actually the result of multiple iterations and optimizations we had to make through the load testing process. Um, often, I think it's easy to fall into the trap of um, you want to scale your, um, your service, and you think you can just do that in a linear fashion by just adding additional resources. However, what we have found is you will commonly run into tipping points at the infrastructure level, with your code, or even at the database. And so, um, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> I really wish I had my notes. I had like little bullet points and I do not have my speaker notes showing. So, um, yeah. So this diagram actually shows one of uh, the iterations we previously had. Um, and what ended up happening is we ran into a 60,000 connection limit from a proxy to our Elixir service. So the, the I, I'm not a networking expert, so I'll say that first, uh, but I'm gonna give a high level kind of explanation of why this happened. So when you make a TCP connection uh, with the TCP packet, there's gonna be four pieces of information. They're gonna be the source IP, the source port, destination IP, and destination port. Three of those four pieces of information cannot be changed given you are trying to talk to a specific service and that IP is gonna be what you're trying to talk to. So what you are left with is modulating on the source port. And source port is represented by a 16-bit number, which means you have 65,000 possible, um, like possible connections at any one time that you can be doing. However, typical Linux configurations will restrict this to about a 20,000 range. Um, it can be changed, but that is the default. So as we were load testing, we ended up running into that exact limitation. We could not open enough connections between the proxy and our Elixir service. Now our Elixir service is uh, backed by Kubernetes and we had it set up with a cluster IP, which means the service gets assigned a single IP address. And this allows you to do things like evenly balance your requests across all of your replicas. So now that I kind of showed one of the problems we found uh, with our load testing tool, I want to talk about how we actually built this. So our tool is built in Elixir, and it has three components to it. 
The first of which is the node coordinator. That's represented by the gray icon on the right. And <clears throat> Uh, this all runs as the same Elixir app, just in different configurations. The node coordinator is a single instance that we configure so that we do not have to deal with a uh, leader election. And it is the single source of truth of what each other Elixir node is working on. The node coordinator then delegates two specific device coordinators, assigning them pieces of uh, specific connections to work on. Then, from the device coordinator, it starts multiple processes within its Elixir node that we call an emulated device, and these are all of the individual WebSocket connections. Now, each device coordinator is working on multiple WebSocket connections, as it would be infeasible to really scale this out to have one Elixir node per WebSocket connection, um, just due to cost and also trying to manage that many VMs within a single network. Um, for context, our goal when we were doing the load testing is we were trying to get to 2 million WebSockets. So now to speak a little bit more on the node coordinator. So there is another consideration that went into designing the node coordinator, and that is that we wanted to keep our load test low cost. Whenever we make changes to the app, we want to be able to easily spin up another load test and see if the changes impact scalability. So to do this, we used uh, what our cloud provider calls preemptible instances. And these are excess capacity in a cloud provider that they will let you use at a significant discount. However, it comes with the caveat of they can take that instance away if they need it. So the node coordinator is constantly checking for any uh, nodes that are going offline and then online. That way, we can reschedule the pieces of work. The node coordinator also handles assigning chunks, uh, or what we called chunks. We um, called it that because we use enum chunk by. And in our, our real customer base, we have organizations that have tens of thousands of devices. And we also have organizations that have hundreds. And we wanted to take and distribute the connection load for her organization across all of the device coordinators. So the node coordinator will then go and look at and take a certain percentage of the devices of each organization and tell a device coordinator to work on that chunk. This allows us to get a more true to life uh, load test, as in uh, our real life customers, they're going to have one WebSocket connection per actual physical device. So we can't get to that true like one uh, device per WebSocket connection, but we can at least make it distributed. When we are doing a load test, we'll also go into the UI and have a <clears throat> test how a large account responds to make sure there's no tipping points on the application side as well. And so when you blast a bunch of messages out to an entire device list of an organization, if one single Elixir node was handling all these messages, we would not be able to handle them as concurrently as we can as if we distribute them across all of the device coordinators. So now to talk about the, the code and how we actually implemented this. The node coordinator is a gen server underneath, and its state is a list of nodes that have been assigned a chunk. So the first thing we do is we will <coughs> Uh, go through our state and make sure all of the assigned nodes are actually still online. And we do this with node.list. Um, I think uh, they were talking about it earlier uh, in one of the other talks. And we use libcluster uh, behind the scenes to connect all of our nodes automatically for us. And then node.list will return all of those Elixir nodes in the cluster. We then go and find all of the online nodes that are not yet assigned a chunk and then do the same thing with the unassigned chunks. From there, we can do this really uh, fun reduce over the non-assigned nodes, finding a chunk to assign to the unassigned nodes. And then we called node.spawn over to a device coordinator to assign it that chunk to work on. Once a node has been assigned a chunk, we then move it into the accumulator that is keeping track of our assigned nodes and uh, send a message back to the gen server to repeat this whole process over again in five seconds. From there, we then move into the device coordinator. The device coordinator is also a gen server that receives that node.spawn request. And <clears throat> it first begins by calling dynamic supervisor.stop. All of our emulated devices are uh, handled and managed by a dynamic supervisor. And a uh, device coordinator can possibly be reassigned to a new chunk. So by calling stop, we will close all of the existing connections 
And then we can restart over with all of the device IDs that are assigned from the new chunk. <clears throat> In the device coordinator, the state is a map of device IDs to the PID they have been assigned. And <clears throat> what we do when we call the start device uh, part, it will go through the state and find the first device that has not been assigned a PID. When it does find one, it will then start the device, capture the PID, and move it into state. We then call back and do the start device over again. Once all of the devices in state have been started or attempted to have been started, we then move into the all device started phase. This will then go through the entire map of devices and check if the process is still alive. Uh, if the process is not alive, this means the connection has been closed, which is actually very common, especially when you're doing this across 2 million devices. I think we'll normally see in the range of a, a 3% network failure. And this allows us to then go and mark them as no longer online. So then when we call back to start device, everything can be reattempted and reconnected. The device coordinator is then managing emulated device processes. We built this on a library called Slipstream, which is a uh, Phoenix WebSocket client implementation. And they provide all the callbacks you need to implement um, and uh, handle a Phoenix WebSocket connection. Uh, they also provide a really nice testing framework to make sure your client is well tested. We also have the goal with the emulated device that we want to return uh, real data. And I put that in quotes because it's not so much that the data itself needs to be real, but more the profile over time. Now, if you think about a device, uh, for example, the fit, like the name uh, piece of a, a device, we would not expect that to change over time. But for example, something like uptime, you would expect to constantly be changing. So we very much more care about the device, the data that should be staying the same is staying the same, and what, shouldn't, uh, what should be changing is changing. And so with that, I, there's something I'll call a predictable randomness. Uh, with the Erlang function, rand.seed, you can set an integer that will start as like your basis for your random functions. So you can see in the first part, it calls faker.word twice, and it returns those two results. I'm not going to try to pronounce those. Um, and then if you then reset the seed back to 0 and call the faker functions again, it returns the same results in the same order. This allows us to use random data across all of our devices, but for an individual di device, we can get consistent data. And the way we do this is by using our device ID as our seed. We hash it, and then we can convert that into an integer that we pass into this function. This function here shows a simplified example of one of our scans. So that set seed function does exactly what I was just talking about. It hashes the device ID, converts it into an integer, and sets the seed. We then set up the initial payload. So in this case, we have two fields, the uptime and the logged on user. Now with uptime, we're going to be expecting that to change. The logged on user, we would not. So every time we set the device ID, when we call the, fo the faker name function, it is going to return the same value every time. Then we set seed again, but this time with an incrementer value added on. That way, we can get a unique value for uptime. To, to show this a little bit more visually, uh, on the left, there is a device that has not yet been scanned. Uh, it's a brand new device. If we then tell it to run a scan, it's going to return the results to us with its name, uptime, and logged on user um, populated. Then if we now start from that populated scan and tell that device to scan again, we will get the same results for the fields we expect and then uptime would be changed. So now that I've talked about the tool, uh, let's actually try and uh, run a load test here. I'm going to do not the 2 million devices. That would take a little too long to get going. But uh, we're going to try 100,000 and see how well it works. Of course, it's going to make me re-log in. So uh, the load testing client is our device coordinator. Uh, so I am now spinning up 20 replicas of that device coordinator, the, uh, well, the client, sorry, the uh, device coordinator. And then the node coordinator, uh, if we look at the logs, is going to pick up those nodes as they got connected and assign chunks to them. So 
One thing we do as we run our load tests is we use uh, a library called PromX. This ties really nicely into Prometheus and Grafana and allows us to, um, it also provides really nice dashboards that then exports all of that data and visualizes it for you. So as you can see here, as the live test is spinning up, we'll get live metrics, assuming it keeps refreshing. <laughs> uh, it takes 10 seconds in between. Um, and so we can see how, uh, how many devices are coming online. Uh, we can see how many connection attempts, and we can also monitor disconnections. Something that's also really nice about PromX is it gives you really nice dashboards um, and uh, a plugin for the Beam metrics. So you can monitor how many processes are running in your system, how many ports, memory usage, um, and basically everything you would really want. And they also have some breakdown charts. Uh, for example, with memory, you can go and see how much each type of um, piece in the Beam system is, uh, how much memory it's using. Um, so one thing you'll note here is, yeah, we're getting close on the port count. Uh, with Erlang, the default port count is set to 65,000. We just barely crossed that. So there are Erlang flags that you can set. Um, so if you use mixed releases, um, it would be in the vm.args file. And you can set uh, the plus, I believe it's plus Q. Let's go check. I have it on a slide. <laughs> yeah, plus Q. Um, let you uh, override the default to allow your Elixir node to run uh, more ports. You can also set plus P to increase the process uh, maximum. That is defaulted to 262,000. Now, uh, one word of warning on setting those two values. When we first started, we set them insanely high, just like, oh, we don't want to deal with these. We're just going to set them like, to an absurdly, like, hundreds of millions. Um, but what we found out is it will uh, allocate significant amount of memory. Um, and so I would recommend sticking with the default, or if you know you need uh, more, uh, be thoughtful about how many you add. And that is all I have. <laughs>